Good morning. Welcome to Salt Lake City. I'm Sarah Zahner, the Associate Director of the Aspen Institute's College Excellence Program. Uh, and I'm joined by four lovely and thought-provoking individuals to have a conversation about the important role that community colleges play in our education system, in our country's economic future, as well as in individual social mobility. So let me go ahead and do a quick introduction of them now. We have Eloy Oakley, the Chancellor of the California Community College System. We have Felix Ortiz. Um, Felix is the CEO of Veritas. And we have Ken Ender, uh, the President of Harper College in Illinois. And we have Mike Colonies, the CEO of Work America, uh, that are going to be joining us for this thought-provoking conversation. So to go ahead and get us started, Ken, I, I want to actually start with you first. Uh, among the many important roles that community colleges play in our education system, one is as an engine of individual opportunity, uh, often for those who truly need it the most. I was hoping you could speak a little bit about um, some of the specific programs that Harper has in place to facilitate social mobility in your community. Right, thanks. Uh, I think many folks think about community colleges and for a lot of the, uh, the students that we serve, we're either their first uh, chance or their last chance. And so we have a lot of people who come to us looking to turn their lives around. I think that the, um, the two things that I would, I would call out as good examples of, of um, programs that we have found to be very successful, one is the apprenticeship program that we have launched uh, with Zurich Insurance. It's a program that's attracted um, students ages 18 to 55, uh, where we provide them a year-long, three-year uh, program of study coupled with work for the insurance company, paid $30,000 a year starting and uh, having their entire um, enrollment covered by Zurich as they serve as an apprentice. So for a lot of people who have never been in a, a salary job before, what a great opportunity. For first-timers coming to us, um, we've just got a ton of traction over the last three years in our manufacturing program. We've built out a program that um, is an, in, embeds certifications within it so a student can literally take nine hours of work and if they need to go out, uh, credit work, go out and trade that for, for value in the market, have a certificate that will s s serves as that passport. So those will be two examples that I would offer. Yeah, great, fantastic. And for the last five, 10 years, many more, community colleges have been incredibly focused on improving graduation rates for students who come from low income, first generation backgrounds, from students who truly would benefit from the education credential Yet today, we're still looking at about 28% as a graduation rate for students who attend community college and are degree seeking over a three year period. Uh, a movement that's really latched on to help increase graduation rates for community college students is called uh, Guided Pathways. And, and California, as well as Harper College, have really been a hotbed for innovation as part of this movement. Um, I was hoping, Eli, you could talk to the room a little bit about the Guided Pathways movement, what it means in California, and, and how it's manifested. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, Guided Pathways is just, um, you know, a fancy way of saying that we're going to create more structure in the California Community College system. Um, you know, for, for years, I mean, our, our colleges were created as opportunities for many different kinds of students. And so, as um, our, our good friend Tom Bailey would say, it was a cafeteria model. And so we're trying to change that cafeteria model, trying to create really mapped out clear pathways for students. Because if you think about the students that we're serving, uh, they're primarily first generation students, students of color. This is their initial entry into higher education. And so we give our, our least prepared students in terms of their network and foundation for understanding how to navigate higher ed, the least amount of support. And if you think about what students who go to selective colleges go get, they get a tremendous amount of structure. So we're trying to create that kind of structure in the California community colleges. So this guided pathway movement really is all about creating structure, redesigning colleges around where students are at, uh, asking the right questions, being data driven, uh, and really changing our approach toward our students. And uh, so we're, we've embarked on it. Uh, our governor has initiated uh, in, uh, in his budget $150 million to really create the largest uh, guided pathways experiment in the nation. Great, thank you. That was a really helpful framing introduction. And could you speak a little bit about some of the legislative changes in California that have helped encourage that model? Sure. So um, back in 2012, we had what we called 
the Student Success Act. Um, and so this was a culmination of years of reform efforts, years of looking at data and everybody raising the alarm bells. So we finally had some legislation passed to relook at how the community colleges are structured and what they should be focused on. So there were a series of legislative efforts, everything from you know, changing the way that we measure success in California community colleges to creating uh, a legislative mandated transfer agreement between the California community colleges and the Cal State University system. The challenge we have had is we've had all these legislative efforts and a tremendous amount of investment, uh, nearly $4 billion of investment in the last five years to improve student outcomes. But those student out outcomes are barely budging. So again, going back to this guided pathway effort, this is an opportunity for us to really leverage all this investment and get it focused on areas that have the greatest impact on moving the needle. Great, thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Felix and Mike for a conversation with two folks who design products that serve the community college market and, and serve community college students. Um, there's lots of folks in this room that represent technology vendors that maybe work with universities or K-12 and, and want to get into serving the community college market. Could you offer some words of wisdom about how you think about designing products for community colleges and their students? Yeah, uh, so for us, you know, one of the big things is when we started doing small polls across the United States with students in community colleges, how many of them had heard of things like LinkedIn? Um, and we had a surprising amount of people say, no, we've never heard of LinkedIn, we don't have a LinkedIn profile. And, um, and when we got them to start using technology, one of the big words that we were getting in terms of feedback was, it's intimidating. So in terms of creating products for students in community and technical colleges, we wanted to create something that was very simple, very easy to use, and in a world that they understand, which is texting. Uh, students really understand texting. Everything's got to be mobile ready and, uh, and simple and straightforward. We don't want them to have to um, you know, write paragraph long sentences about themselves and their backgrounds and things like that. Um, it's got to be designed for our demographic. Uh, yeah, I actually attended a community college first semester before uh, going into the military. Uh, so I, I look at this from three different lenses. One is an entrepreneur, one is actually a student, and the other one as a paratrooper uh, military uh, individual. So when I was coming out of the military, uh, you, as a veteran, you get a DD-214, basically where it allocates your military occupational skills, uh, your, your any competencies, any you know, issues that you may have had. In civilian life, uh, we don't have a permanent profile on educational data that takes that all the way through employment and matches you to employment and a pathway. So it just dawned on me that, you know, why doesn't that exist uh, you know, within the higher education world and specifically community colleges because they're the pipeline for local employment. Uh, so we decided to create a skill passport that basically ingests data within, you know, by integrating student information system, ERP systems, to understand what are the skills profiles these folks have and be able to validate that to match them and recommend them to a pathway and a job. But more importantly, you know, as states start getting uh, focused on accountability of measures on unique wage data sets and things like that, uh, post-employment accountability. So uh, really, when, when you think of the community college market, uh, you know, first of all, I'm very happy that ASU has a panel on community colleges, because six years ago it didn't. Uh, and uh, more importantly, that technology and investors are understanding that the importance of community colleges uh, within their local environments, and it's no longer just a philanthropical effort, but an empowerment effort. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's the way that I view, uh, you know, the market. Felix, how, how do you um, um, see the exchange that, you're, that your students, or the folks that you have now uh, grounded their competencies, how do, how do you, how, what do they exchange with the employer? How, what's the yeah. passport? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Mike made a reference, you know, to LinkedIn. Um, you know, as, a, as a, I was speaking at a conference on Saturday where there was these kids that wanted to understand what is a pathway into technology. Uh, most of these kids come from projects, low-income communities, and they have no confidence, you know, they lack confidence. So they're not going to be on LinkedIn because where are they going to say, you know, I was a plumber or whatever it might be, and LinkedIn has created this notion that, you know, it's, uh, you have to be a professional. However, a plumber makes $100,000 a year, so there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and so the way that we look at this is that there should be a common set of shared data that you create in a skill passport, and no matter where you start, you know, I know you're a big proponent of starting as early as possible, K-12, 
uh, that data flows with you and is maintained all the way through post-employment and beyond, and that once you get employed in, in you know, an example like a XYZ company, that unique record is now internal, so that if the employer wants to say, hey, I want to hire Ken in, you know, in Palo Alto to go to level two uh, position, I can see what is the pathway internally to move you and progress you forward. Uh, it, it really becomes that permanent profile for employability. You, you know, the, part of the um, challenge that I think uh, we have, particularly as we think about micro-credentialing, is how to um, tie that to some, uh, and only one that comes to mind quickly in higher ed, the almighty Carnegie unit, which employers do understand because we've, we have fashioned our degrees and certificates around them. I, I think you're onto something that's really important, and I think our challenge will be is how do we signal what that means in a way that has broad and universal appeal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll give you an example. I, I think some, uh, you know, Salesforce obviously is leading a whole apprenticeship movement, right? So they have this, uh, <clears throat> you know, focus on 1.9 million by 2020, I think the number is. But most people in community colleges are focused on training people in coding. Uh, when the reality is that there's a better path into tech uh, beyond coding, which is uh, being a enterprise installation, uh, enterprise developer, where you can have 80,000 to 112,000 range and get a certificate in five to 10 days. Um, so the, the way I look at it is, you know, essentially reverse engineering uh, the data that's coming from the economic development corporations on companies that they're, uh, you know, recruiting, localizing, and then feeding that data to the community colleges so that you guys are ahead of the curve when it comes to your curriculum and alignment of credentials uh, to what the you know, state or city might be you know, recruiting. I think Ken raises a really great point, which is that several years ago when MOOCs began taking off and we started hearing terms like digital badges and micro-credentials, there was talk that these alternative credentials were going to revolutionize our higher education system. Yet today, with a couple of key exceptions, alternative credentials have not become the same type of accepted credential as more formal degrees offered by community colleges and universities. Um, Mike, sort of representing the employer perspective here, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about what you really believe the challenges are in terms of alternative badging taking off. Yeah, well, a lot of it has to do with what employers are, are fully aware of uh, in terms of A, what's being taught at their local schools um, and what that means for them and, and their business. Um, but then what do these credentials mean? So for example, you know, a lot of times when we talk to employers and say, would you guys be willing to accept this type of credential and badge? They have to ask us what that means. And we can show it in a resume version. I said, we don't care if it's in a resume version or if it's a badge or a credential, just as long as they actually have those skill sets. So for us, it's more about translating what that means to them. Um, and we like to do that by bringing employers actually into the classroom. So a lot of the schools that we work with when we have an employer that says something like, we require two years worth of experience, and we say, why? Why do you require two years of experience? Is it for insurance reasons, or is it because you simply don't know what's being taught at your local schools, uh, and therefore you, you have this arbitrary two-year requirement <coughs> before you start hiring? Well, we've done this on two separate occasions now, where we've brought people in who require required experience, brought them into the schools, show what they actually teach, and in one, one scenario, it was a welder, uh, welding company hiring MIG aluminum welders. And as soon as the school found out, they donated aluminum to the school. The school added that into the curriculum. And uh, they're very adaptive and willing to change that. So it's more about kind of making that communications process more seamless. That's interesting. Now I'd like to shift it back, shift it back to the college perspective, Eloy and Ken. Um, we heard a little bit from uh, two folks who serve the community college market. And I'd love to hear your perspective on what you wish technology vendors and others knew about best supporting your college's mission and your students. Uh, so Eli, perhaps we can start with you. Sure, so you know, I think from my perspective, you know, we're trying to educate um, a cohort of individuals to navigate you know, the new economy. Um, and the sand keeps shifting in front of our students. So, we need to be more dynamic. So the more that we can partner uh, and get support from technology firms helping um, sort of smooth out that um, all those changes that are taking place, uh, the better. But at the end of the day, we want to educate individuals 
to not only get into uh, an employer's workforce, but to survive an economy, to survive the changes in the workforce. And so we need to ensure that there's, um, you know, uh, that we're working together to support the needs of this class of students because, uh, you know, we can say that uh, we're going to create this whole network of new certification for this group of students, and you know, who are we talking about? We're talking about low-income students, we're talking about students of color, um, and without a clear path toward building on that education, toward the kinds of credentials that we know are gonna lead to higher wages and a higher social standing, then we need to be careful not to create a different strata of employees. Um, so that's what I would say to, to my friends in, in technology is, we need to work together so that we are supporting students not only to get into the workforce tomorrow, but to make sure that they have a path toward future learning, future credentialing, and so that their social mobility isn't a dead end after we get them into this first uh, uh, level of job. Yeah, I would, I would uh, add to that that I absolutely believe that we're nowhere near the scale of production of credential, skilled, knowledge, competencies of individuals in this country that we have to get to to stay relevant, frankly, in the 21st century in a global economy. From that perspective, I, I think we need to think much more about the vertical integration of uh, not only secondary and post-secondary education, but then employment. And I think companies that are are thinking about products that would provide a backbone, um, a, a electronic backbone of support for that throughput that take a, a, a student from a stu from the student lens all the way through the employee lens and support that individual over a lifetime of work. I think that's the future, frankly, of public education. Um, how, we, how we weave together the network of secondary, post-secondary employment with a uh, path that, that folks generally understand, it's universal, it's ubiquitous. Uh, we'll never get that on our own. We have to have smart entrepreneurs that have real money behind them to help us create those types of systems. I want to get a little bit more specific here. I think that grand vision is absolutely a compelling one, but there are so many data challenges that stand in the way of being able to realize that vision. So it's sort of an interim. In the last five years, we've seen an absolute explosion and the number of higher education technologies that are available at your disposal. I imagine many folks on your staff get calls from vendors every day um, asking for you know, an audience to demonstrate their newest technology solution. Which aspects of your institutions, in terms of sort of day-to-day -day operations, do you feel like technology is really the right way forward? And which aspects of your day-to-day -day college operations do you feel like are really best left kept to the realm of, of people? Um, so let's start with you, Eloy. So, uh, you know, for California, this is a scale issue. Um, you know, we have 113 colleges. We serve more than 2.1 million students. One out of every four community college students in the nation is a California community college student. So we have tremendous scale. Um, so part of our challenge is, you know, how do you create data systems that um, take advantage of that economy of scale, at the same time provide the individual support for a college in Siskiyou County in Northern California all the way down to the LA area. Two very different populations, two very different challenges, but there's a need to create um, systems that help us get the data we need to support students. So um, that's, that's part of the challenge. So for us, we don't need, um, uh, we have a long history in higher ed of taking a, uh, uh, amazing product and using 10% of its capacity, okay? But we paid for 100% of its capacity. We need to quit doing that. We need to take, understand what are the fundamental pieces that we need in order to achieve the next level of uh, outcome increases and focus on that and, and work with tech companies to help us design those technologies because, you know, when you invest a few billion dollars in California to improve student outcomes, everybody and their mother is there trying to sell a product to the 113 colleges. 
uh, without, and everybody says that everything integrates, of course. I've never heard anybody come to me and say, my product doesn't integrate with what you're trying to do. <laughs> but we know what happens. We implement it, and before you know it, oh, it didn't quite integrate. Uh, so um, so in, in California, we're trying to talk about this challenge. Uh, as we implement this Guided Pathways framework, we're trying to hold off on purchasing data solutions because, you know, we've come up with our own key performance indicators. So we know what those performance indicators are that will help every college. So then how do we create data solutions that every college can gain access to, regardless of whether they're a small college, big college, uh, you know, well-funded college, not so well-funded college. So that's, that's what we'd like to make sure and partner with. Ken, anything you want to add on to that? No, I think it's, it's, it was covered the water pretty well there. Eli, I think you said the magic word, which is that for so many colleges, a big challenge right now is, is utilizing existing technologies and resources right. that they have. And now I'd love to hear from Felix and then Mike talking about kind of your standpoint on how you feel like tech vendors can better support colleges that might not have the resources to encourage technology adoption on their campuses. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that from our perspective, it's, you know, it's an educational, uh, you know, process where from it, it all comes down to implementation. Uh, because if you can't implement the solution, then you can't provide any value to the college. Um, so what, what we notice is that, you know, usually within a college, there's a, you know, we call them a, a champion uh, who will be the point of contact and, you know, we hold them accountable to nine weeks of implementation. So in nine weeks, you can be fully implemented in an ideal way. Um, however, I think one thing that happens in community colleges is that, you know, one department doesn't know what the other department is doing, uh, and then the other department assumes that they have a, a great solution because they've built it internally, but it's not scalable. So when, when we're looking at, you know, um, you know, partnerships, we're looking at regional scalable partnerships. So California is interesting to us because we already have regional uh, partnerships in key regions in that area. And the governor there, as you know, you probably can add more of that, has broken it to like seven regions or six regions uh, to really hone in and create these uh, data interoperability settings. Um, and you know, I, I think that having, and it goes back to what I said earlier, which is a common shared data set. Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, there, there's, there's four important uh, integrators. One is the UI wage system, uh, but they provide geographical, non-unique data set. Uh, then you have the data warehousing of K-12, and that's in another unit. And then you have, you know, whatever else the, the colleges may have implemented because they invest in it in a good heart, but really students aren't picking up on it, so, you know, they may have invested a couple of million dollars and it's, you know, flatline. Uh, and so then how do you, you know, the, you got to tie in all those systems uh, to really create what Ken was talking about, which is this permanent profile. Uh, put through employability and beyond. I think California just started a pathway on uh, the gig economy, uh, where you basically can be an Uber driver uh, and actually have your own business as well. I mean, there was an article in New York Times where this actually California community college student was making $250,000 a year. Uh, he would you know, drive the people around and sell them jewelry. Uh, and, and, and so on, uh, and, and he's doing pretty well. So, so you know, the, the, the community college students to me are, are interesting because they not only are the most important part of our future uh, from an employability standpoint, but really to local economies because they don't always have to be pushed to be an employee. They can also be pushed to be an entrepreneur uh, and create those local jobs. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that's the way that you know, we've been framing that and looking at it when we look at it from a data standpoint. Yeah, the way we always do it is, is we think about building something that, again, is very specific for our demographic. I think in terms of entrepreneurship, um, you know, the advice that I can give is that a lot of times startups will be stuck in Silicon Valley building a tool that they believe is right for everybody. And um, you really have to understand who you're serving and why. And uh, when we started the company, you know, we did not have the background in terms of um, community colleges. So what we did is we went out and got offices inside community colleges and worked with the faculty and staff on a day-to-day -day basis and most importantly met with students every single day. Uh, and that's how we were able to understand the people that we were serving, how we were serving them, and actually be able to create a product that we know that they're actually going to use. Um, for us, you know, we're an online marketplace. We have employers logging in. We have students logging in. We're going to give access uh, a school portal but we don't want to build the school portal yet until we have a school partner that says we're going to build it with you. 
So we're 100% free to the schools. We just want them to help us design the product for their side so that we're not building something that we think is right. We want something that they know, the KPIs that they're looking for, how they plan to use it, and then actually have them help us design it. Great. So we talked a little bit about various technologies to support student success and postgraduate student success. We talked just a little bit about pathways. Uh, and now, so Ken and Eli, what I'd love to hear from you is, let's pretend um, that your respective governors have decided, never mind, you've been really underfunding the community college system in our states for a very long time. You have a 50% increase in your budgets. Um, so you're free of the, the typical budget constraints that have confined innovation in a community college setting. Ken, let's start with you. Where do you choose to invest? <laughs> You know well, you're from Illinois. You know, yes. I, I'm thinking, <laughs> if I got 50% of my budget, then I got 50% of the appropriation I was supposed to get. So, <laughs> so I'm starting 50% in the hole. Um, you know, I, I put, I'd really put a huge bet on, uh, on developing, uh, investing the money in, in uh, support that would integrate um, assessment of, of students' interests and their capacity, along with um, what we know from a predictive analytic perspective about um, a group that might look like them, and then uh, to be able to provide some real guided um, uh, advice that helps students choose appropriate early goals and uh, invest in the, in the support system that moves them along. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, intrusive engagement with students. I, I, I just think that with a lot of our students who frankly don't know for sure why they're at our institutions, but they know that's a ticket, if they can figure out how to punch it, that we've just got to get much more active in their lives. And I don't see how we do that without a strong technology uh, intervention. Thanks. Eli, what about you? Uh, so if... Um uh, Governor Gr Brown gave us 50% um, more than what we're getting today. Uh, um, y you know, we, we have certainly been underfunded. I mean, uh, uh, per student funding for the California Community Colleges is, is one of the lowest I in the country. Um, uh, but, you know, recognizing that throwing more money at the current system is not going to give us necessarily better results. Certainly, would we hire more faculty? Yes. Would we pro uh, support um, more professional development? Yes. Uh, but I would like to um, find an opportunity to create um, the 114th campus uh, and start it from scratch a and take what the technologies that we know are, are showing promise, te teaching techniques, uh, education delivery models, and start it from scratch. Um, because the challenge we have in California is it is such um, the regulatory burdens, the structure is so entrenched that it's hard to really uh, innovate at scale in California, in any one of our colleges. We have some colleges that are better adept than others. Uh, and that's not to say that we don't have innovation, but most of the innovation that occurs needs several years to incubate and to really take off. And for it to be scale across the system, uh, it really uh, requires an act of Congress. Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, I would propose that we, we find a place to almost start from scratch and, and see what can work, and then from there take models and help the other 113 colleges figure out what they can take from that new model or what they can't take or what they can learn from it. So that's where I'd put the money. I mean, we're seeing a pretty interesting example of that now in New York with the uh, Gutman Right. experiment. And um, it is true that I think all of us are trying to figure out how to build the thing while we're operating the thing. And um, if you could put it off on a little cocoon and, and, and design it, I don't know that any of us are going to get that opportunity, but uh, I'd pay a lot of attention to Gutman. I think they've got some good ideas there. I noticed neither of you directly mentioned talking about free community college tuition or reducing the tuition burden on students. And now we've seen Tennessee and Oregon and other states starting to consider this free community college tuition model. And 
in isolated pockets. I know you all have experimented with that in your respective institutions. Um, Ken, let's start with, with you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on if you really think this is a promising model for meaningfully boosting graduation rates among students. I think, so, well, I think what's true, and I think what we have uh, pretty universal recognition of is it's difficult to imagine any young person in our country living a self-sustaining type of uh, lifestyle that uh, has a decent shot at, uh, at middle class in a retirement program. It's hard to imagine any kid in this country establishing that without some post-secondary credential. So the idea that post-secondary is universal is absolutely, I think, on the mark. That being said, and I think we could have an interesting debate, it's, I, I, I get, I have trouble with free. I think most um, folks think we've already done that with public uh, education. I know that there's an argument that this should be extended for two more years. I frankly think there's enough money in this country that would provide an opportunity for every high school student to earn two years of post-secondary education by just meeting some simple benchmarks that are aligned with uh, becoming career ready and workforce ready. And w the program we've designed at, at Harper does that very thing, that we take soft fr freshmen in high school and they sign a commitment to work on certain um, behaviors over the course of four years in high school and graduate college ready. And if they do that, they will receive a first year tuition at the college in the second, the third, and the fourth. We've had a tremendous community support to invest in that and raised a lot of money so far to make that a reality. That can happen in any, any community in our country. I'm convinced of that. Well, I could spend pretty much half the day talking about this topic, so I'll try to make it short. Um, uh, first of all, you know, I am a big believer of the College Promise movement. Uh, obviously, uh, Long, when I was at Long Beach, we established a Long Beach College Promise, <laughs> and part of the Long Beach College Promise includes a free year of tuition at Long Beach City College. So um, my experience at Long Beach showed me that changing college-going culture in a community matters. So having said that, uh, California community colleges were free before. Uh, and we still had students failing. So in and of itself, free college isn't the answer. Uh, free college can be part of an answer, uh, only if used correctly. Uh, so, you know, you have to stop and think, what, it, what, is, what is it we're trying to achieve? And if we're trying to achieve improved outcomes for students, we have to make sure that we are getting these students into institutions, into systems, that are properly aligned, just as Ken's been doing at, at Harper, that have a focus on student success, that have reorganized themselves to ensure that there's correct course taking patterns, that there's actually a route toward a quality credential. And then, if introducing free uh, gets students who wouldn't otherwise, or families who wouldn't otherwise be thinking about going to college, thinking about it, then that's an effective means to an end. Uh, so, in my mind, uh, we have to step away from the um, political or media headline, free college tuition, and make sure we understand what that free is for. Uh, and you know, the, the, the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, in California, California has the lowest tuition of any state in the country for California community colleges, $46 a unit. So uh, the cost of tuition isn't the cost of attendance. The cost of attendance in California community colleges is the cost of living, the transportation, books. A student living in the Sacramento area going to a community college, it's more expensive for them to go to school than to go to UC Davis. So we need to make sure that if we're talking about free college, we're, we understand what we're trying to answer because if reducing the cost of attendance is the case that in California, you can't do it by lowering tuition or eliminating tuition alone. You have to do it by making it easier for students to go debt-free to college. That means more aid, that means getting them to go full-time better, that means a whole lot of things, getting them out in time so that they can actually participate in the workforce. So I know that's a long question, but you know we've gotten so used to the easy headline, free college, that we're forgetting what the free college is for. Yeah, great point. We've talked a lot today about success, and we've talked about it as a measure of graduation rates for students in a community college setting. And I think only now are we beginning as a field to have a conversation about 
what success should be for community colleges. And there's a growing focus on thinking about success in terms of post-graduation outcomes. So job market placement and so on. Um, I'd welcome perspectives from the panel about five years from now, how should we be defining success of institutions? And perhaps, Mike, uh, we can start with you on the end there. Uh, yeah, flexibility. Um, for, in terms of people graduating, getting as many job opportunities as they possibly have. Um, you know, right now, you know, the small polls we've done, over 90% of people find their first job through their instructor, um, which means that the instructor has to have a lot of uh, relationships with employers in the area. And they typically don't. So a lot of times, employers or students are going off to work for the same employer. So being able to, A, give them more opportunities, B, giving them that pathway to be able to come back to school and get reskilled so they can continue climbing that ladder. So in five years, if somebody can graduate, have a job, and know exactly where they need to go to get to where they want to be, um, that's what I would consider success. I guess I would think about it, um, graduation rates are important, but I, I'd, I'd rather a little bit of a nuance. I'd think about completion rates, particularly completion rates around micro-credentials uh, that are tied to the local economy. I think that the, the you know, we, we, I think we want to get better at demonstrating that students actually learn something with us so we don't have employers wondering what, what happened with, with this exchange. Um, it seems to me that in five years from now, we'd, we'd want to see a, 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 not a leveling because it's going to take some time, but at least some improvement around um, lifting the boats of all students who come to our colleges. We have very uh, disproportional rates of success between majority and minority um, students, and I think that, that if we can raise the bar for everybody but close the gaps, that would be a significant contribution to the, to the nation. Um, yeah, I, I think accountability, uh, specifically accountability on uh, income mobility uh, to ensure that, you know, a lot of these students that enter community colleges uh, are lower income, uh, you know, type of bracket. So ensuring that the school, uh, that this, the skill that they're earning and attain aligns to the job that the local market demands and that these folks are actually resulting in upward mobility of income. Uh, and I think you can reverse, and, you know, we talked a lot about uh, a, a lot of good stuff, but really we didn't talk about uh, utilizing data to automate advising. You know, in, 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 uh, in community colleges, there's like one to like, you know, I think California, one to a thousand, I don't know the exact number, but uh, you know, these students uh, need a lot more assistance. So the, the utilization of data, I, I can envision in five years, the community college being data driven from inception of entry point where they have a permanent profile that ties in all their skills and has automated data advising uh, that then feeds that data to an advisor and then matches that individual to a pathway, a job, and reverts that data back to the college. Uh, I think that you know, the underutilization of data is actually hurting community colleges. Um, even though that, you, know, you have two leaders here who are very innovative, oftentimes the culture uh, within the community college doesn't enable for execution to be optimized, and as a result, you have adults fighting each other where the students are the ones that are being impacted. Uh, and that doesn't help anybody uh, because it reduces the ability for people to move up into the next level of income. You mentioned, I just want to follow up on one point, you mentioned the underutilization of data on many community college campuses is a real problem. Could you give a specific example of what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what happens is, as I go back to the example, there's a, you know, a, I don't want to name systems, but there's, a, you know, a specific systems and specific technologies that are basically, you know, the, the campus doesn't even know how to read it. Uh, you know, think about this. You're paying for a system, and you don't even know how to read the data. And then you don't even share that data with your colleagues uh, because you're in competition with them. Uh, or, or you think, or you may not have a relationship. So uh, really that's you know, why I think what you know, Eloy is doing a, a, in California and creating a, a focus of common shared data. Uh, so it's a scalable solution uh, is critical because you know, that will allow everybody to have the same, it's like a social worker, right? If you think of a social worker, they have like a manila vanilla folder, they have the whole insight 360 degree view on the student, everybody can have that. And right now there's silo views which do, do not enable them to really empower that student to move forward. Uh, so I think this is a great question because we have gotten so comfortable thinking that credential um, production is the right way forward. Um, uh, and to a certain degree it is, but it's a very blunt in instrument that 
really, um, uh, you know, the focus of our jobs in education, particularly in higher education, is to give people a means for so social and economic mobility. That's the key. That's the outcome that we're after. Uh, now, you can measure that, or you can try to say that a proxy for that is a bachelor's degree. But the key output is how, how do we affect the economy, the, the civic engagement of the communities that we serve, and how do we measure that? Uh, you know, some people have you know, looked at this as a, a, a collective impact theory. You know, how, how do we measure that? And so I hope that we, we get to measure this a whole lot better in the future. Instead of just focusing on the credentials, let's focus on the impact that the institution is having on the community it serves. Are we moving students along? Are we moving working age ad adults along uh, and moving them up the economic ladder, or are we not? Uh, and so that should be the ultimate measure. And so, you know, if you think about the value that's created by a, the perceived value of an Ivy League education, I think Joe Biden put it perfectly when he said, what an Ivy League education gets you is access to a wealthy roommate. Okay, so that's the value it creates. It creates the social networks that allow you upward mobility. Um, we, want, we want to make sure and find a way to measure that at the community college level and you know, through the whole public system. How do we create that value for the community? And if it's credential output, if that's the best measure, great, but we need to find better ways of measuring that. It's a great point, Eli, and I know there are some deep challenges uh, in capturing reliable measures of that today. Would love your perspective as of now, what key performance indicators, what metrics are you looking at as measures of how the California community college system is doing? Well, we're, we're looking at sort of the traditional measures. Uh, we're measuring six-year cohorts like most institutions are looking at. You know, we're, we're looking at a completion of 30 units. We're looking at um, a completion of certificate degrees, transfer readiness. Um, and we're now starting to change that focus because these, these are very much um, uh, lagging indicators and we're starting to pivot and start looking at much more leading indicators that tell us with some predictive value what is happening to students, you know. What, we, we know what some of those key gateways are, you know. How long does it take them? Are, are they finishing college level math and English in their first year? You know, where are they being placed? How long is it taking them to get to sophomore status? Uh, so we're starting to pivot and, and take a much uh, deeper look at what data, what indicators tells us the most about how our students are progressing and trying to use that, those performance indicators and get them into the hands of all 113 colleges so they're, we're comparing apples to apples. So with the Guided Pathways uh, implementation, that's, that's what we're looking at. We're working with uh, the Community College Research Center, Columbia. Uh, we've developed those KPIs and that's what we're rolling out over the next year. Thank you. Uh, to shift gears a little bit in the last five minutes of our conversation, I wanna talk a little bit more about the emotional side. Uh, of being individuals that serve the community college market or lead community college institutions. And Mike, I wanted to start with you because you mentioned when you first began this work, there was a lot that you had to learn about community colleges and community college students, so you intentionally chose to locate your offices at Anne Arundel Community College, I believe, um, was, was where you said um, you chose to base. I'd love to hear a, a story uh, about a student that shaped your philosophy um, as a leader that serves the community college market. So a community college student that shaped how you think about this market and how you serve it. Yeah, well, so, I mean, we got into this business because my co-founder and I, we each graduated four-year degrees. Um, we were promised to have a job after investing time and money going to school. Uh, didn't have jobs waiting for us at the end. So that's where we really got into this, this arena, where we said, this is the skills gap. Everybody's talking about this. You know, 2012 presidential elections is the only thing everybody could agree on. And, um, so we said, all right, where are, where are the biggest jobs, uh, where's the biggest need, and who are the people that need the most help? And so that's where we landed on community and technical colleges. Um, without giving uh, examples of individuals that we've, we've worked with, uh, if you take the demographic as a whole, you know, average age is between 27 and 31. These are people that have families, people that have mortgages, they have car payments, credit card debts. It, they can't afford to do what I was able to do when I graduated, didn't have a job. I was able to go live in mom and dad's basement. Uh, so 
we need to be able to have this type of setting where when people graduate, they know the job that they're going into before they even graduate. And then again, of course, having that kind of pathway forward. Um, and so for us, it's the people that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis are people who will come in. Uh, it's actually pretty great. Car breaks down. We've actually had an auto tech be able to run out and help us fix it. Um, it's, it's very good for a startup company, not having to ex spend money on things like that. Um, but it, it's the real life basis. I mean, these are people that you get to know. Uh, when they come into the rooms with you, you're not always talking about jobs and career readiness. Um, I've spent 20 minutes talking about relationship advice. Uh, and so that's what our career services departments are, are doing. And when you have one career service individual trying to help between 1,500 and 5,000 students on average, um, you realize that they need help. And so that's how we got into what we're doing and, and how we're actually to feel that we know we're making a big impact. Yep. And Ken, I, I am gonna go back to the specific student example and would love to hear about a student that you encountered in your work that caused you to decide to become a community college president. <laughs> His name is Ken Ender. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a first generation college student. I went to a, a college that um, if we went to it today, it'd be a community, it'd be a university, it's a community college on steroids. Urban institution, mostly professional schools. I went, didn't have a clue why I went. And if it hadn't been for the intervention of a lot of good faculty and, and, um, and staff, I would not have ever finished that institution, much less the rest. So I, uh, I go around our institution every day. Um, there's thousands of students on our campus and I walk down the halls and I look at them and I think to myself, does anybody know you're here? Do you know we know you're here? And until I can authentically answer that question, yes, my job's not done. Yep. I, I do think that we've got to find strategies, and I think you, you guys, are, the money and the tools in the room um, can put us there. We've got to create a personal experience for every student who comes through our door, and we've got to invest some real investment in those individuals so they have a, they have a, a knowledge that they're, they're, they understand why they're here and, they, and we help them get through it. So that's, that's my passion and, and it's it, what drove me into the work many, many years ago. And, um, and I think we're at the cusp, frankly. I mean, I, am, I think this is the best time in the world to be a leader in higher education because it's crazy. There's more opportunity. I mean, listen, we got our backs up against the wall. There is no money. We have to change. This is a great time, and you all could be a tremendous help for us. Absolutely. Felix, I'm going to skip you because I have one final question for you. Uh, and Eli would love your answer about a specific student or yourself that helped shape your decision to be in this field. Well, I mean, certainly I was a community college student and coming back from the military, so just as Felix's uh, experience is concerned, a lot of this uh, I rely on my own experience, but also really the, the people I grew up with in, in uh, inner city in LA. I mean, uh, it, it shouldn't be that um, the key indicator to who succeeds and who doesn't is luck. Right. Uh, we need to eliminate luck and make, make the playing field uh, clear and even for all students to have the opportunity. I was lucky. <coughs> uh, I do this job every day to ensure that, uh, do my best to make sure that students don't have to be lucky to get the opportunity I had. And Felix, in the last minute that we have together, we've talked about a lot today, but I'd love to hear from you about next year at GSV, what major education trend do you think we're gonna be talking about? <laughs> it's a big, uh, big ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, what we'll be talking about is this whole notion of data accountability. You know, I, I am a big believer uh, in accountability and data being utilized to enable that. So. Uh, right now, I think 35 out of 50 states uh, are utilizing accountability. Uh, I think that you know this. Uh, what will happen is these community colleges now will have to understand how to align all of the data, uh, create data interoperability. I think that's going to be a key word uh, moving forward. This whole interoperability aspect of educational metadata, workforce metadata, and employment metadata uh, to ensure that these students um, have a permanent profile. Uh, that becomes like their credit score. I mean, if you think about it, all of us have credit scores. We don't even know, like, uh, you know, we, we have a pattern. Automatically, the credit score will say, oh, you have a you know, 800, and you can get a mortgage. That's great. Uh, but we don't have anything like that in the world of education to employment. 
uh, and, and I believe that that's the future of where we're headed to, uh, and that data will enable that. Uh, and so next year, you know, accountability uh, plus um, you know the, the interoperability. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for listening. Thanks to these four uh, for a lively conversation. We'll be up here for a couple minutes afterwards, and come say hello.